Thanks for joining us. I'm Diane Rehm. In the early 1950s, three planes crashed in Elizabeth, New Jersey, over a period of several months. More than 100 people died, and the unusual events transformed the town. Judy Bloom grew up in Elizabeth during that time. Her latest novel, just out in paperback, is based on some of her memories of what happened, as well as archival research. The book is titled In the Unlikely Event. Judy Bloom joins me in the studio. You can also see live video of our conversation by going to drshow.org. You can call us, 800-433-8850. Send us an email to drshow at wamu.org. Follow us on Facebook or Twitter. Judy Bloom, it's great to see you. Thank you. It's such an honor to be here. You have no idea. Oh. I feel like it's the culmination of my professional life. Oh, my <laughs> goodness. Aren't you I lovely? Do. But I don't want it to be the end of your professional life. And yet you said that this may be your last novel. Tell me why you're feeling that way. Well, it took me five years to do this book. I'm 78 years old. Um, I... Uh, I don't know. I want to have fun. <laughs> and writing isn't always fun. You know what? I said this after Summer Sisters, so nobody believes me. I said, I'm never doing it again. And then I said to my husband, George, will I be okay? I don't want to be a bag lady. And he said, you'll be okay. You don't have to do it again. And then I had to do this. I had to do it. If something like that happened to me again, of course I would do it. But I don't want to I don't want that five years. I'm so happy now waking up in the morning. I look up and I say, thank you. I don't have to write today. And you have a bookstore. Well, I don't, thank you, I don't have to write today. And instead, I can go to the bookstore and have a really good time. Now, you and your husband opened that bookstore how long ago? Um, I think it was the end of January. But, you know, it's a long story. It's not that we really um, thought about opening a bookstore. We had been badgering Mitchell Kaplan, who owns Books and Books in Miami, for five years. Key West is a, is a town of many writers, many artists. Um, and we had no bookstore. No bookstore. Uh, except, one, you know, one that sells, um, what do we call it? older books and remainder books. And we needed a bookstore. And Mitchell said, I want to, I want to, I want to. And finally he said, I can't. I can't hmm. do it. Hmm. And um, so but if you, said, but if you and George figure yeah, out a way to do it, exactly. he said, I'll partner with you. Oh, that's terrific. And so we did, and we did, and we do. And it is so exciting. And I'm so uh, happy for you. <laughs> now you. I want to get to the plot of this book because I gather it's really something you lived through. You know, I lived through, was I there? Yes, I was 14 years old, um, the winter. It all happened in 60 days. So I was 58 days, actually. I was there. I was in eighth grade. Um, but was I like my characters, who are all fictional? Um, no, I wasn't deeply involved, I mean, or maybe I was, maybe I was. Somewhere inside, I must have you been were because, deeply involved. Yeah, I buried this story for 40-something, no, m way longer than that. How many years? Who knows when I was 14? <laughs> 1952, I was 14. So talk about what happened. What happened was that I can tell you about the first um, the first crash, I was in the car. It was a Sunday afternoon in the middle of December, just before Christmas. I was with my parents and my best friend. And we were doing the Sunday afternoon dinner, movie, whatever it was, when uh, news came over the radio um, that a plane had crashed uh, less than two blocks from my junior high school. Now, it was Sunday so we weren't at school. 
Um, and I can just remember looking at my friend and thinking and talking. I, what I really remember is my father saying, I have to get back. And my father, who was a dentist, knew that he would be needed to identify victims at the morgue. And that was never spoken of again in my house that I remember. Wow. But I'm quite sure that no adult ever spoke to us, not at school and not at home, or to any of my friends. And so it happened. It was a fluke. You know, we didn't fly around then the way we do now. Fly. I had never flown. Um, and so, yes, I remember all of the, I remember what happened. I don't remember, or I have buried, how I felt about it. But yet, how you may have felt about it has come through in the characters you've written. I mean, there is a scene in this book as one of, as the first plane goes down that is so heart wrenching. And yet, Judy Bloom, there were two more crashes within those 58 days. What? Yes, which is crazy, right? Crazy. I mean, imagine if that happened today. We would be on purple terror alert or whatever. Um, but there was no uh, TV news then. We had TV, but no, sure. no newscasts. So we didn't come home from school. We weren't overwhelmed by it. The newspaper, it was up to the newspapermen and the photographers to let people know about it. But I'm not sure I read the paper then. I don't remember ever reading about it. And yet I knew, and I don't want to scare your listeners here because the book is about characters and it's fictional and and there's joy and love and hope absolutely um nevertheless the background is if you can call it background these three crashes the second crash i remember very well i don't know how i remember but i knew that it just missed the girls high school we had two high schools in our town sex segregated and um, the girls' high school, it was the end of the school day. The plane was piloted by a young man, a pilot with a lot of experience in flying, who had grown up in Elizabeth. I'm convinced that he knew that was Batten High School, that he did everything in his power to get over that school because it looked like he was coming in right through the windows. And it was terrible weather. It was so foggy. Everything was different then. You know, it was more dangerous. Um, I'm getting on a plane today, and I'm not scared. You know, and I, I, I want your listeners to understand that, too. I don't know anyone of the kids that I grew up with who is afraid to fly today. Now, uh in that second tragedy where, in fact, the plane missed the school, still there were deaths. And then mm -hmm. there was a third. The third was maybe the most dramatic because the third came down into the playing field of the only orphanage in town. So we have a junior high, a high school, and an orphanage. That plane, I don't know how it was possible, but there were survivors in the third crash. And um, the flight attendant, we called her the stewardess then, was actually rescued by the boys from the orphanage who came running out into this freezing cold winter night they were awakened in the middle of the night and they rushed into the burning and exploding plane and wow. they rescued many people. And of course, you have a character, Mason, who is from there. <laughs> an orphanage who does his part to rush in to rescue. 
I should say, too, that you've looked at an awful lot of archival material in order to create not only the facts of the book, but drawn on your wonderfully creative imagination to bring forth the emotions that people must have felt and endured during those three tragedies. I cannot even imagine were that to happen today, as you said earlier. I mean, it, it would it would just be moments of utter terror. We're going to take a short break here, and when we come back, we'll talk more with Judy Bloom. The book is titled In the Unlikely Event, and don't forget, you can see Judy Bloom going to drshow.org. with Judy Bloom, who is known to young and old and adored for her books. The latest just out in paperback is titled In the Unlikely Event. She is actually the best-selling author of 29 books, including the preteen and young adult novels, are You There, God? It's Me, Margaret. Also, Blubber and Forever. This book, In the Unlikely Event, takes its quote from something that we hear airline stewards and stewardesses say quite frequently. Yeah, really. I always listen now on planes. Do they really still say it? In the unlikely event of awe. Uh, yes. Um, I don't always hear them say it anymore, but it's interesting that when I needed a title for this book, uh, and I needed it right away, and I had been working on it five years, and no title had ever come to mind, I was telling a friend of mine about the book. She had never read it. She hadn't read anything about it. But I was telling her and I was explaining that I needed a title and I wanted it to be something airline-y, you know. Sure. <laughs> She's the one who came up with the Isn't title. Isn't that wonderful? Without having read the book. She did. And my daughter was a commercial airline pilot. So folks, you know, wow. I flying must be in my blood. Of uh, course. In my genes. Of course. And she never knew this story. Huh. So, and yeah. the other similarity here is that 
the father in this book, the dentist in this book, is beloved by everybody, as is Corinne, the mother. Uh, but Mary, whose mother is a single mother, keeps wishing somehow that he could be her father as well. I think um, a, a lot of then girls who grew up with me wished that my father could be their father. Because they um, loved him they so loved much. Him. They loved him. My father was, he died at 54. Wow. So, you know, I never got to know him as adult to adult as well as we ever know our parents. But um, he was a wonderful, wonderful man. And um, yeah, he was. Uh, uh, my editor says that someday a graduate student will write a paper on teeth in Judy Bloom books. <laughs> <laughs> teeth play prominent teeth. roles yes, in your books. And, and dentists too. And now I, um, I say I like to do dentists as heroes. <laughs> I think that's lovely because dentists are so often maligned. They are. And I just got in the bookstore, a book just arrived that's called Demon Dentist for Children. And I'm thinking, oh no, do I really want Demon Dentist on my bookshelves? Did he treat children as well as adults? In those days, I think you treated everybody. Everybody. Yeah, yeah. I think so. Yeah. Um, let's talk about Mary. She is the young woman who really is at the center of this book. She is the daughter of a single mother, Rusty. She has never known her father. She has friends whom she envies because she and her mother have so little, but she has such a great heart. She does, and so does Rusty, I think. I think I love Rusty, and I love Irene, um, Mary's grandma. They all live together, yes. uh, together with Uncle Henry, too, who becomes uh, a star reporter reporting these tragedies. Um, that's how he comes of age. Isn't that interesting that in some ways it takes something like a tragedy for one person to step up and really do it. And as soon as that crash occurred, he knew he and he had someone with him and said to him, now you keep taking pictures, just keep taking pictures. And of course, he's writing the whole yeah. time. I don't know if you've ever seen any of those cameras and the name of the camera has just flown out of my head, but it's amazing because they have to keep taking out and putting in. Oh, I can't tell you what it is, but it's not like snap, snap, yeah, snap. Yeah, no. right. They have to keep changing it, the whatever it is that they have to keep changing. I knew all of this when I was writing the book, but that's, that's gone now. Um, yeah, it was... Uh, Amazing. I met um, um, the, the, the newspapermen that I was following, and that's what they like to be called. I felt that they were my friends because I was reading their stories, you know, every day. And I actually met a couple of the grown children of one of those newspapermen. I met so many people, Diane. You that would take another show. But on the, just so you know, on the, at the third crash, when there were survivors, there was a teenager named Seal Bell. And I wrote about her in the book, you know, because why not? She was written about in the paper. And then at one of my readings, there was she Seal was. Bell. Oh yes. my gosh. Yes. What was that meeting like? It was wonderful. Of course, it was in public, but she's a spunky, spunky woman. And I said to her, so Seal, did you ever fly again? And she said, two weeks later. Huh. I wasn't giving up my trip to Miami. How interesting. 
Yeah. She rescued her mother. She wouldn't get off that plane without her, without mother. her mother. So many of the characters, though, in this book are the young teenagers, um, the ones who see th things, who try to please their parents a great deal. Well, you know, it was the times. I mean, people say to me, how did you get that so right, that time and place? And I say, well, that, I remember it. It that, was my I lived time. Through. That yeah. was it. Yeah. And, you know, nineteen early 1950s, I mean, our parents had been through the Depression, had been through World War II. Now we were fighting in Korea. Um, they just wanted us, I say they, anyway, my parents, just wanted me to be happy. And that's the role I was to play in the family. Be happy, no problems, give us pleasure. And it's a terrible burden to put on a kid, really, because you know you can't always be happy. How did your father die so young? Why? My father was the baby of seven siblings, and no one lived to be 60. Um, my father was 54. He died suddenly of uh, a heart attack. And, um, you know, it was the event of my life. Of course. That colored the rest of my life. That still does. I was with him. You were with him. I was with him. At the mm -hmm. moment. Holding his hand, yes. And I was... Just weeks before my first marriage, I, the invitations were out, and my father just looked at me and he said, "Ugh, what lousy timing!" Uh, <laughs> oh my gosh. gosh, I know, I know. And where were you when he had a heart attack? Well, I think it was happening in the car as we were driving home from the airport. We had just picked up my brother and sister-in-law. Um, my brother was in the Air Force, and he was coming home on furlough break, whatever they called it. And and they announced in the car that they would be having a baby. And I remember my father saying, what a banner year for the Sussmans. And then the car swerved, and my mother said, Rudolph, what's the matter? And we got home, and he got out of the car, and he lay down. And um, the what we call the rescue squad, then the EMTs came and they went and they came back. And, you know, today they would have taken him to the hospital. Of course. They, they could have given him clot-busting drugs, but not then. Very, very difficult. Um, I'm glad you were with him, though. I am glad you were with him. Um, the idea of you and I grew up in the same era. I'm a bit older than you. I think it was an era of making sure that parents didn't know anything, any sad thoughts mm -hmm. that we were having, mm -hmm. um, any problems that we were having. We kept those to ourselves and shared them probably I did anyhow with friends did you I'm I was just going to say you were lucky I had friends and I had a best friend and she is still my best friend all these years later but in those days both she but she and I kept our family secrets. Oh, really? We did From not, each other? We did not you did share not them. share those? No, we did not. My best friend and I lived diagonally across three streets and an alleyway. <laughs> and yet she could look out her front window, I could look out the back window with binoculars and communicate with each other. And we preferred doing that to being on the telephone. Um, well, you had your own telephone. Absolutely, that was your telephone. Absolutely. Yeah. No, Mary and I, Mary and I, you know, spent all day together in school and then 
came home and talked on the phone all night. All night. And it was okay to fall in love with the same boy and say, how many times did he kiss you? How many times did he kiss you? But a lot of the deep down stuff, really, really important stuff we didn't share. Today we do. Today you do. Oh, yes. And oh, yes. We can talk about those days today, but we didn't. And then. what were some of the things that bothered you the most back then? Oh, well, there are always family issues, I think, in any family. And um, that was certainly on my mind, but I don't know that I could have even put into words my fears, my anxieties. I, I mean, and that's the interesting thing. I was a, I was an anxious kid, and yet I lived through all of this. <laughs> and well, I guess I put it someplace. Yes, you know, I must you have did. put it someplace for all these Clearly. years. Didn't pull it out again until that specific moment, and, and when that moment came. You know, I was listening to another writer on stage talk about a book that she had written uh, based on stories her mother told her about growing up in the 50s. That's all that I heard. This was Rachel Kushner before she was Rachel Kushner. This was her first novel. And when she said that, it just came to me. It came over me. The, the whole book, I suddenly had wow. all the characters, the plot, everything. I knew where I was starting. I knew where it was ending. I mean, nothing like this has ever happened. And to yet me. it took you five years. Well, yeah, to do all the research exactly. and to get it right. Very and you're listening to the Diane Rehm show. And don't forget, we are video streaming this hour with Judy Bloom. We've got lots of callers on the phone. We'll Take some of them right now. First to Annie in Lynchburg, Virginia. You're on the air. Hello, ladies. This is such a treat. Oh, Judy, I'm almost 40 years old, and you're taking me back today to my bed with the strawberry shortcake comforter. And I read all about the adventures of Super Fudge when he ate pizza's turtle. <laughs> <laughs> and I also wanted to say that um, you always made me laugh, but then you helped me understand what growing up to be a woman was like with, are you there, God? It's me, Margaret. Mm. And it was the beginning of my faith. And I am so grateful to you for helping me understand those complex times. Well, thank you so much. I'm glad. And let's go to Elaine in Rockville, Maryland. You're on the air. Judy, hi. Um, I grew up in Elizabeth, New Jersey. Uh -huh. I'm a few years older than you. I lived in the same Elmore section that you did. We probably were on the, what was it, the 24 bus going to Batten? Yes, we uh, were. You, yeah. And um, I was at Batten when the second plane came down. I was um, uh, playing volleyball. We had a game after school. I don't know why. Uh, we had something like a, a fire drill had to go outside in our blue um, gym. Oh, I remember yes, that. Which, which was probably the most traumatic event of the day. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, like you, though, I, I don't, I, I, going through your book and with my book clubs, especially, I was the, uh, the resident historian. Um, there wasn't a page that I could turn that I couldn't say, oh, yeah, um, Hadassah, she named her, her doll Hadassah. I went to school with Hadassah, who she named her after, um, in the streets and the stores and, and the people. So much of it came back. And um, I'm so happy to hear that you're still good friends with uh, your best friend from back then, because I am, too, with uh, the girls that I went to, uh, to school through Elizabeth with. And uh, it was just a treat. But, Elaine, only. let me ask you very quickly about... Yeah. When that uh, second plane crashed, yes. what kind of impact did it have on you? Well, you know, I had we had already been through the first one, which um, you know, went down on the Elizabeth River near the uh, the junior high school Judy went to. Um, so, 
I, but like Judy said, she, I, I'm, we didn't. I didn't read the newspaper, so and we didn't have a lot on the um, the radio. So I don't think I was so. Um, uh, I wasn't Hopefully. scared by yeah. it. I mean, I could see the the building burning, but it was more all more about um, what you talked about with your your girlfriends afterward. Wow, that really I think is I think something. that's the truth. I yeah. mean, I I I imagine that if I had been um, Christina, one of the characters in my book, who actually witnesses two of these crushes, it would be a different thing. Judy Bloom, and the new book is titled In the Unlikely Event. Short break here. Don't forget, you can watch this hour video streaming. Welcome back. For those of you who've just joined us, Judy Bloom is with me. She has written 29 books, the latest of which is titled In the Unlikely Event, a phrase perhaps you still hear when the uh, airline attendant tells you, in the unlikely event, uh, event, we lose oxygen, this will drop down, make sure you put it on the child next to you first, and so on and so forth. So far, what we've heard is that because there was no 24-hour news cycle, most of the news about all of this, three crashes within 58 days near Elizabeth, New Jersey. Most of it sort of went by. In your book, however, there is one character who is deeply, deeply affected, and that's Natalie. Tell us about Natalie. She is Mary's best friend. Yes, she's Mary's best friend. Um, would Natalie have gone cuckoo anyway? I don't know. Natalie, um, things were happening to Natalie, and and 
you know, the fact that planes were crashing just seemed to make it worse or happen sooner. Uh, Natalie loses touch with reality mm. briefly. Um, she does come back. I, I don't want any spoilers here, but <laughs> um, it's not a hopeless book. And I think that's what's most important. The characters are changed and the choices they make are changed because of what happened at this time and place. Um, but life goes on, as as Irene says, life goes on, sweetie pie. <laughs> you know, life is for the living. Um, my father used to say that to me. Every time one of his siblings died, life is for the living and life goes on. And I believed him. And it did. And and even when he died, life went on. And you're still allowed to be happy and fall in love and have friendships. Um, and it goes on. The extraordinary uh, thing that I might have thought would have happened is that people might leave. <laughs> that town think it was <clears throat> jinx think i gotta get out of here yeah but it wasn't that easy then i think i mean one family in in the book we don't know them well um a girl who goes to school with miri and natalie her family does choose to leave they can they can afford to the father's job allows him to leave but I don't remember anybody ever thinking of leaving I mean that was home and one thing I should say is when it comes down to well how come you know this happened in Elizabeth well Newark Airport was again flying was new you know flying from place to place going on vacation that was all very a new Absolutely. idea and Newark Airport was right there and the flight path took planes in and out over Elizabeth. After the third crash, Newark Airport was closed for nine months and um, the flight paths were changed and never have again taken planes over Elizabeth. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, was there something in the research you did to indicate there could have been a flaw, a blind spot, uh, an obstacle to pilots that had they been taken on a different route might not have occurred? No. The reasons for each crash was different. I mean, we have the CAB reports, is that what it is? Uh, yeah, we have Civil their Air. report. Yeah, mm -hmm. thank you. Um, it's funny because it seems so long ago that I wrote the book and did the research, I, but I know I knew it all so well and I can still conjure it up. Um, each, each plane was a different reason. Um, and yet, and yet the kids, the kids in the story believe as the kids in my class did that it was all about them of course because they're kids right and and we thought they are out to get us whoever they are and that ranged from you know zombies to communists to alien creatures and spacecrafts um they were out to get us because why else would it be so close to schools and an orphanage um and to make sense of it, you know, the smart girl said it's sabotage, hmm. a word that I loved and yeah. agreed with, having no idea what it meant. <laughs> but I did look it up in the dictionary. But of course you do include a lot of original text in the book from the newspaper. Yes, I do. Um, yeah. And I actually was using it exactly as it was and I've still maintained the language of the 50s. I mean, the purple prose, you know, the, the plane came down like an angry wounded bird or the plane, um, uh, what was it? Something, it wasn't a marshmallow, a soggy 
not an eclair, but what else? <laughs> Something like that. I'm sure my husband's back there trying to tell me, but I can't <laughs> see him. And your husband actually <laughs> helped you with he the did. character of the journalist. Henry, yes, because when very late in the game, the lawyers at the publishing company decided that I could not use the the um I could not give these stories to Henry Ammerman. It could not be his, what's the word, his byline. It could not be his byline because even though the actual journalists were no longer living, I would have to change. I would have to change the enough wording. about these yeah, stories. Right. And that was like, no, you can't do this to me. This book is already scheduled. I'm still, I have so much to do in the revisions. How will I ever do that? I can't. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then my wonderful George said, who's a great writer, by the way, said, I can be your Henry Ammerman. Oh, isn't that wonderful? And we set up a newsroom in huh. our apartment in New York. And it was like, you know, I was the managing director and I was um, throwing stories at him. And then he would come back and I would say, make this better. And he would come back. We had a good time. That's great we that you time. were able to work well, with it's him great. on that. It's great that I have George in my life, yes. And How so, long have you been married to George? We've been together 37 years. How wonderful. It's I'm so glad the last for 37 you. years of my life. Ah, I'm so glad for you. So you've written so many books, Judy. Um, you think? I don't think it's that many books. 29? Yeah, but I wrote them. I was very um, prolific in the beginning. You know, I needed it so much. It so changed my life. It gave me my life. And just one poured out after another. <laughs> but then after I met George, I got happy. And I, I used to tease him and say, you ruined my career, but I'm happy. <laughs> but I can still, I could still conjure up the angst that, helps you write a book, I think. All right, let's go back to the phones to Doug. He's in Athens, Ohio. You're on the air, Doug. Hi. Um, I just wanted to thank the both of you, uh, Diane, for uh, continuing the wonderful show. I listen often. Thank you. Um, and Judy, I, I, I'm from Elizabeth, New Jersey, oh. and as a, as a toddler, I actually... Um, Witness the a little bit of the aftermath of the crash into the Jenna Memorials grounds. I, I remember uh, all the windows turned orange, and uh, and then my parents told me to go to bed. Oh, so, wow. I, um, no one ever told me that, Doug. But I have since met and become friendly with uh, a man who was a young boy about Mason's age. He was in ninth grade. I was in eighth when this happened, and. Uh, it's very interesting that we've now met a couple of times, and each time we we just feel this connection, <laughs> you know, this connection because how many people are interested in this terrible night that he lived through? I'm glad you called, Doug. Thank you, Doug. Thank you so much, and. When you think about a young boy seeing orange windows, knowing. I never was told that. This wow. is a first. That too bad I can't go back. Yeah, that exactly. In the, book. If exactly. the windows turned orange. Judy, in terms of all the books you've written, you've had a number that librarians or school districts have said no to. Tell me your reaction when that's happened. Well, let's not give librarians a bad name here because it's very rarely the librarians. Um, maybe back in the early 80s when people were running scared. But um, for the most part, yes, yeah, school boards sometimes, you know, would think or still do think, um, no, we can't have this. This is too Which controversial. Book? Which oh, book? Oh, so many of them. Name one. I mean, Blubber got hit big, really big in Montgomery County. Isn't that a nearby? Why? On what oh, grounds? Um, on not hitting the reader over the head with a message that it's bad to be a bully. And... I was telling a story 
you know, where I knew that kids would get it. They didn't need to be hit over the head. Uh, we didn't even call it bullying then. I remember. And, you know, we didn't say right. bully. Victimization in the classroom. Um, but it's the same thing. It was a mean girl. And um, and she did her she did her mean work there. And, so uh, yeah. to what extent did you want to or did you have to fight back once those school boards or whoever yeah. said? Things we never think we're going to do. Yeah. But then push comes to shove. You bet. And yes, I, I had no voice in the beginning in which... To fight back. But then I was introduced to the National Coalition Against Censorship. And through them, I found my voice and I found a way to fight back. And to this day, um, I like to think I work for them in talking about, you know, the freedom to read and how important it is. And they're just a wonderful small organization and they do great work. And if something is happening in your community and you don't know where to turn, you can call the National Coalition Against Censorship and you will get a real person on the other end of the phone who will help you um, and help you get through this. Wise words. And you're listening to the Diane Rehm Show. Now to Evansville, Indiana. Hiya, Holly. You're on the air. Hello. I just wanted to call and say um, that we grew up with her books, with Judy's books. And my mom was a fourth grade teacher. And she encouraged her students to read Judy Bloom. And they were just such a part of our childhood. And uh, I don't recall, and I grew up, you know, 70s, 80s, and I don't recall my mother ever saying, let's not read this one, let's not read that one. Um, Lucky you, lucky you. Yes, and I went to a parochial school, and I don't recall that, which would be a school that would be one to say, oh, no, we can't read that. Yeah. Um, and now my five children all have enjoyed your books. We love your books. And I just wanted to thank you so much for your contribution to children's literature. It has absolutely changed our lives. And Thank we, we you so much. Love them all. Thank you, Holly. Thanks. You know, the best gift my parents ever gave to me was the gift that reading is a good thing. I could read anything. There was no, they didn't, maybe they didn't know enough to worry. I don't think so. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, you know, I was free to browse through the books uh, in our living room, and we had a lot of books, and there were no YA books then. And by the way, I don't consider myself a YA writer because maybe Forever <laughs> would be YA today, but when I wrote Forever, there was no such category as YA. Right, 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 and, right. Um, and so I went right to their shelves, and I was reading saw Bello. Everything. <laughs> I was reading everything. And I might not have understood it, but I was curious about the world of adults. Judy, you talked about the fact that your dad died so young. Um, did your mother remarry? My mother did not. Widowed at 54, lived to 83, never remarried. I don't think that she really wanted to. I, I, I don't think so. What was it like for you at that point? You were about to be married. Mm -hmm. How did the loss of your dad oh. change your life? It was terrible. It was, um, I mean, talk about parents who never talk to their children about anything. My mother never spoke of that day that my father died. Never spoke about it. I mean, we could tell little stories later on about daddy this and daddy that. Um, but that day, never. Never spoke about it. Never really let me see her cry. Once I came <laughs> into a room and she was crying. And... I think we were both so taken aback that I just turned around and left. 
You know, I talk about everything to anybody who will listen, maybe because I grew up in this household where important things were never talked about. You and I have much in common. Oh, I know we do. I know we do. And I'm so glad in this last year of my being on the air and perhaps the last book you might write that we've had a chance to share time with each other. Not as glad as I am. Ah, Thank you, Diane. Thank you, Judy Bloom. And the book is titled In the Event of... Thanks all for listening. I'm Diane Rehm. The Diane Rehm Show is produced by Sandra Pinkert, Denise Couture, Rebecca Kaufman, Lisa Dunn, Alexandra Botee, Susan Casey, Danielle Knight, and Allison Brody. The engineer is Alex Drewenskis. Visit drshow.org for audio archives, transcripts, and podcasts. Our email address is drshow at wamu.org. And we're on Facebook and Twitter. This program comes to you from American University in Washington. This is NPR. Support for NPR comes from NPR member stations and from the financial services firm of Raymond James offering personalized wealth management advice and banking and capital markets expertise, all with a commitment to putting clients' financial well-being first. Learn more at RaymondJames.com. And from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, dedicated to the belief that all lives have equal value and working with partners to help envision a world where every person has the opportunity to live a healthy, productive,